afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for taking the time to come and listen to this presentation today. It's sort of a two step presentation. I'm going to speak a little bit about our plans for the Northern Ireland Trusted Research Environment, uh, the background to the space of trusted research environments and what it means for us here in the HSC. A little bit about secondary uses legislation and a little bit about public involvement in this space with patients as our partners. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. With you. So um, I, I've left time at the end of this presentation for questions, or if you think it's something while we're going along, please just put it in the chat and we will get to it at the end. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit around work that involves how we will deliver our expectations and aspirations within the data strategy. I know Dan presented to you, Dan West, our Chief Digital Information Officer, spoke to this um, um, dispatches um, in January. So what I'm talking about today fits under the data strategy, which is one of our regional strategies that we're currently delivering. And within that, the work of the Data Institute. So as Lisa said, the Northern Ireland Trusted um, Research Environment is part of the delivery of the Data Institute. And it's a piece of infrastructure that helps us to realise the impact and improvements from digitisation of the HSC and the use of our data. So before we go forward, I'm going to go backwards slightly. We're here now in 2024. But if we go back 20 years ago, we need to look at the different points of decision making and governance that have led us to where we are now in the use of our data. And when we say secondary uses, people automatically assume that means research. However, as the use of data changes over time, secondary uses and the definition of secondary uses has been changing as well. So secondary use can be audit, it can be evaluation and it can be research. So going back 20 years ago, we saw the establishment of the Northern Ireland Research Ethics Committee, OREC NI, part of a UK wide infrastructure around ethics. And you'll see why that feeds into trusted research environments whenever we move through. We had the research governance framework set up which was a way in which we received and managed and handled applications for research projects. And of course, data research fits within that family. We saw the establishment of a privacy advisory committee, advisory in its capacity because it's not currently a statutory body. And I'll speak a little bit about the regulations that will enable that going forward. And then we saw the legislation in 2016 around secondary uses of data. There's an interesting time point here in 2019 and 20, which obviously saw COVID-19 and our responses to that. Since 2020 to where we are now, there has been a seismic shift, both in the four nations and wider, in how we utilise health and social care data and in the public's understanding and engagement with the use of their data and how it impacts them, both in their receipt of care and more widely in, in society and how we can use health and social care data to their benefit. Within the space of Northern Ireland trusted research environment, the things that are important to us and that I'm going to touch on with, within this presentation are these pieces. So as I've said, the build out of the trusted research environment falls within the data strategy and the data innovation um, aspect of that. We're going to look a little bit about legislation that surrounds this and governance. In 2022, there was a paper on called Better, Broader, Safer, and known as the Goldacre Report, which set standards for how we should use health and social care data for research and analysis. Since then, last year, we saw the O'Shaughnessy Review. The O'Shaughnessy Review is a UK response to clinical trials and how to build up our clinical trial capability, since that was greatly impacted during COVID, and we had some great demonstrators of use of data during COVID. And obviously, whenever we're talking about use of data to support clinical trial activity and to support research, the use of trusted research environments become an enabler. In a wider context at the minute, we're seeing the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill going through the United Kingdom. That's one that could actually have a presentation all to itself. But in Northern Ireland, we need to see how that piece of legislation will affect our handling and use of, of data and the implications of GDPR or anything that might um, result in changes to the Data Protection Act. We also have seen last year HSC R&D have established a new research approval service, which centralises applications for requests for clinical trials and research in Northern Ireland to make us um, make it easier for researchers and for people to engage with the HSC system for research. And of course, provisioning of data to support research is a key element of that. So I just wanted to show that a trusted research environment is a very it's a very niche area. It's a very specific thing with a, a number of people who might want to utilize it. But the provisioning of data within those and the support of research and evaluation has a much wider impact. And this is where we have come in the 20 years since the establishment of our Research Ethics Committee and the Research Governance Framework in 2003. 
So at the minute in Northern Ireland, some of you will be aware that we have the Honest Broker Service. The Honest Broker Service is a data safe haven established 20 years ago. And the role of the Honest Broker Service was to give researchers access to trust data that was held in our regional data warehouse and to put a governance system around the application process to use that data. The Honest Broker Service was a key resource for Northern Ireland participating during COVID in what we called national core studies. So in part of the COVID-19 response and research response, the UK government funded national core studies. And one of those was called the Data and Connectivity National Core Study. And that saw significant investment across the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland, to set up infrastructures that would allow us to use our data for research. One of the things that we did was to ensure that the data that was currently held within our regional data warehouse was advertised with, the, with an innovation gateway on Health Data Research UK. I can send all these links out at the end. So if you're interested in going and looking at these um, pieces of infrastructure where our data is held, you can have a look yourself. New principles were published by HDR UK and by the HDR Alliance in around how we improve public confidence in the use of data through trusted research environments. And that saw us here in Northern, Northern Ireland, along with the recommendations from the Goldacre Report, to set up the Northern Ireland Trusted Research Environment. So that's to build out on the capabilities and the structures that we have in the Honest Broker Service more widely to ensure that we can provide the best quality of data and analytics for secondary use of our data. The Northern Ireland Trusted Research Environment is one of the three pillars of the Data Institute. So along with coding and standards and analytics and insights, the Northern Ireland Trusted Research Environment focuses on the development of data and connectivity infrastructure to enable collaboration in the <coughs> use of our data. And by collaboration, that means collaboration with our patients, our public, with clinical academics, with data analysts, and that's with those within the HSE, but with partnerships that we would have with other health service organisations and with, um, with academic institutions and with industry where we have the appropriate governance controls in place. So what is a trusted research environment? Trusted research environments are also sometimes called secure data environments. People have often used the term a safe haven. Um, but trusted research environment is the common, a common name used for data safe havens which are created for a research purpose. They are typically digital in their, in, in their delivery. Some of them used to be standalone units where you used to have to go in literally into a physical safe setting and sit at a computer that was not connected to any other system or process to enable you to work on data which was deemed sensitive. In the past 10 years, the digitization and their capabilities for access to data have saw that greatly improved. And in Northern Ireland, three years ago, we enabled remote access to data via the Honest Broker Service to allow researchers from across the UK to collaborate <laughs> on research for the benefit of our patients and our public. So how is data safeguarded? One of the principles under trusted research environments, and you saw that I've shown you some of the HDR UK Alliance documentation on setting better standards for use of TREs. The principles that we work under are called the five safes. Safe people, safe projects, safe settings, safe, safe data and safe outputs. Safe people means that researchers or data analysts who wish to work on the data have to be specially accredited. And that accreditation is a standalone UK level accreditation that is not given by the HSC. So it provides a level of security and assurance that researchers are trained and have, and have been um, aware of data standards and capabilities before they're allowed to access our data. Safe projects, again, going back to the establishment of the UK research ethics committees, and we also have university ethics committees, only projects which have been through a rigorous ethical review and also a peer review for their scientific methodology will be permitted to use safe havens. And again, that ethical review and the scientific peer review are both independent of each other and independent of the TRE. So again, another level of independent assurance of before somebody comes in to work on our data. Safe settings means that the access to the data is only possible through secure systems. And again, that is the provisioning of the digital infrastructure, much of which has been rapidly improved under our digital and data strategies in the last two years and will continue to do so in the following years. Safe data means that when researchers come into a trusted research environment and they've requested some information from the library of data that is held for a particular research project, they will only have access to de-identified data. That means the identifiables such as a patient's name, address, 
or any other characteristics that would enable them to be identified from within the data set are, are removed. So researchers only see privacy protected data within the analysis setting. Once they have conducted their analysis and they want to produce outputs, which may lead to publications or lead to policy reports or an audit and evaluation may be used then to change or use services, those outputs go through what is called disclosure control. So again, an independent person from within the trusted research environment will review the outputs of the analysis again to ensure that the privacy of the individuals within the data sets is protected and that no one is identifiable from the data analysis. So the Northern Ireland Trusted Research Environment and the Honest Broker Service that currently sits within it sits within a range of other trusted research environments and secure data environments across the world. There are classically brilliant examples that exist in Canada and in Australia, but more locally here we have Public Health Scotland's EDRIS service. In Wales they have the CL Data Bank. The British Heart Foundation Data Science Centre is exemplary in the work that it does in the UK and Q Research exists in Oxford University. So that's just a flavour of the types of trusted or secure data environments that exist. Each secure data environment is different both in its, or in its organisation and, its, and in its governance supports. So some of these secure data environments exist just within universities, such as Q Research. Some of them exist within public health frameworks, such as Idris and Public Health Scotland, and some are a collaboration between the two. So the SEAL Data Bank, for example, is governed and delivered by NHS Wales, but also with Swansea and Cardiff University together. So there are different models of orchestrations of secure data environments, but the principles and standards that they work to commonly agreed through what is the UK Health Data Research Alliance, which I have stated in the middle and which NIDER is a member of, as you can see from the map. They set the standards um, and provisionings that we expect people to be able to evidence and support in order for us to be able to provide assurance to our patients and to these individuals as data is held within these secure data environments and indeed to data controllers that how the data is held, processed and used for analysis is safe. So the Northern Ireland Trusted Research Environment, our vision and what we know good looks like will be a fully integrated longitudinal primary and secondary care data set for the HSC that is accessible through a safe data environment. Currently, we have regional data warehouse, which, which holds some of the data sets which originate within the trusts. There's a system of governance that allows the data controllers from within the trust to allow individuals access to that data through the Honest Broker service. With the rollout of our digital um, our digital and data strategies and with the improvements that we are making both with EPIC and Encompass, there are challenges that exist in how we retain access to some of the longitudinal data sets that EPIC will replace and how do we link data retrospectively and prospectively to give us that vision of health and social care data that we want to utilise in order for that to be a data product that we can use for benefit for our patients. The Northern Ireland Trusted Research Environment aims to create a collaborative space to support establishments of those data partnerships to bring clear benefit to the use of our data. This is all for secondary use. However, a lot of the work that we would do through evaluation and through audit of, da of data impact on the primary delivery of care in Northern Ireland. So it's not always for a research purpose and research itself and delivery of research is recognised as part of the patient care pathway. So going back to the three pillars of the Data Institute, one of the pillars is analytic capability. With the rollout of our digital strategy and during COVID, the Northern Ireland Health Analytics Platform gave us a digital capability that we simply didn't have in Northern Ireland before. With the Northern Ireland Health Analytics Platform as the driver digital framework underneath, running underneath the Northern Ireland Trusted Research Environment, we have the capability and skills and tools to do things with our data that we previously couldn't. So some of the information that you see here, I'm sure you've seen before in relation to the health analytics platform and our digital capability. If you look at the words used here, like registries and dashboards and platforming, what that will allow us to do is to ingest vast quantities of data from de data sets across the HSC and map those together, link those together and provide a governance structure through the Northern Ireland Trusted Research Environment to be able for those to be used as a data asset and resource for secondary purposes. That's why the Data Institute and bringing together the elements of coding and analytics and governance under the trusted research environment is critical to our success in maximising the inputs from the investment that we have through our data and digital strategies. 
So what I've been talking about today refers very much to this data safe use hierarchy. So what we've been speaking about is the use of data for secondary purposes, whether that be research, evaluation or audit. But what I'm going to talk to you now is about the use of patient identifiable information. So within a trusted research environment, the data that is accessed is de-identified by default. What we're going to talk about now is the potential for use of patient information in an identifiable way um, for purposes other than direct care. So this is in relation to the Health and Social Care Control of Data Processing Act 2016. Some of you will know this as the Secondary, Secondary Use Act. But what this does is allows Northern Ireland to sit alongside England and Wales to have a statutory body which would have a common law duty to review applications to use patient identifiable data for purposes other than direct care. So some of you in the call might be aware of the confidentiality advisory group in the UK. This would have a similar function to the confidentiality advisory group. So where an individual within or outside of the HSE wishes to use patient identifiable data for a purpose other than direct care and where they believe that that is in the circumstance for a health and social care purpose and is in the public interest, they must make an application to the statutory body to get permission to use data in that way. The legislation requests that the regulations support the, this, uh, this statutory body, which will have a public appointed chair and deputy chair that there will be a statutory code of practice and patient confidentiality. So we currently have an advisory code of practice for patient confidentiality that will become a statutory code. We will have to develop and implement a regional opt-out system. That will mean that the Northern Ireland public will have a portal by which they can request that their personal identifiable information is not used for a secondary purpose, which in this case would be evaluation or research. And there will be the creation of criminal offences for the breach of regulations. So it's quite a serious piece of legislation for Northern Ireland. It was drafted in 2016 and I'm the lead for the implementation of the regulations following that legislation in 2016. So what does that mean in practical terms? In practical terms, what we're looking at here to the left hand side of the screen are some of the UK registries and audits that exist that currently Northern Ireland data cannot be shared with. This is both a practice and quality issue for Northern Ireland. So at the minute, we do not have a legal gateway or a statutory body that would allow our practitioners to request that identifiable information is shared from Northern Ireland to some of these UK audits and evaluation structures. What that means is that our information cannot then be evaluated for patient outcomes and compare that to UK standard outcomes. Not being able to do that means that we're lacking the information to inform the delivery of practice and shape our policies. So this statutory body will allow that to happen and enable this to happen. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see a collection of different research enterprises, NIHR, CTRIC, which is based in Derry, Data Can, which is a health research hub for cancer, Belfast Smart Cities and Isaric 4C, which is a COVID-19 research um, programme, all of which have been inhibited in Northern Ireland participation because we do not have a statutory body whereby identifiable data can be shared or used within these initiatives for our patient and public benefit because we simply don't have the legal framework and the statutory framework to consider and support the use of data in that way. The reason why NIDER is in the middle is because whenever you want to bring information into a trusted research environment or secure data environment, the data that you bring in is identifiable in the first instance. That data is then stripped out of its identifiers to allow it to be used in a privacy protected way. But if you want to bring that data from the HSE system into a secure data environment, we would need the authorization of a statutory body to permit us to use that identifiable data in a secondary way but with the provisioning that we're doing it to make it de-identifiable so that we can put it to good use. So these are the ways in which this legislation is an enabler for us and is a very, very, um, it's a piece of legislation that stretches way beyond research and much more into quality improvement and practice outcomes. So what does all of this mean? I've showed you in 20 years that we have had a seismic shift in how we approach research in general and data research as a niche area within that. The data that we use within the HSC and the data that's generated across the UK, across this island, across Europe and the world has affected how people perceive what we do with their data and their feelings towards that. 
up until two years ago, Northern Ireland was the only part of the United Kingdom that did not have its own standalone public panel to discuss the use of data. Myself and my colleague Elizabeth Nelson from the Administrative Data Research Centre took some investment money from the Data and Connectivity National Course Study and we developed a pilot programme to develop the Northern Ireland Public Data Panel. So along with the really long public engagement and patient engagement that we have in Northern Ireland, both in our consented research models and in things like PEER, which is our patient involvement and engagement for research panel, this will sit as a piece of infrastructure that exists between health and other infrastructures, the Northern Ireland Public Data Panel is not just a health, health initiative to engage the public in discussions around the use of their data. We have an advisory panel which has representatives from Sale Data Bank in Wales, from Research Data Scotland, Belfast City Council and Involve, and they are helping us to shape best practice on how we deliver the Northern Ireland Public Data Panel. It was, as I said, funded initially from some money from HDR UK, and we have just received some money from HSC, R&D, NIC or RG programme. We were moving to recruit members to the public data panel this summer. The reason why these two slides, um, I think they're slightly unprofessional, but the reason why they appear like that and why NIPDP doesn't have a logo or a tagline is that the key permit permission of within the NIPDP is that it will be co-developed with those who are members of the committee. We won't decide on the look and feel of NIPDP, its logo, its tagline, or indeed its um, development and, and sustainability model until we actually have members of the public on the panel to be actively engaged in the development of the infrastructure itself. I'm very pleased that Northern Ireland now can say that we have a public data panel um, and we've already had lots of requests for topics in relation to the use of data to be brought to the panel. So when it's up and running, maybe we'll come back and talk to you about who's a member and some of the topics that we're going to discuss. But the main thing that we'll be looking at is developing public data literacy, defining what public, public good means, whether that be from a patient perspective or from a member of the public, and to increase and the utilisation of the publics as our resource as stakeholders to support us and actually challenge us on what we do with the use of their data. Some of the stakeholders that we worked with in terms of NIPDP are quite diverse. We worked with Understanding Patient Data, we worked with HDR UK, NICFA, the Cancer Registry and Bernardo's as well across the UK. We took a service design approach, which means that we looked at models of delivery for other public panels and patient panels and um, survey organisations to see what the best approach would be, particular to Northern Ireland and our population. And that will continue to evolve and change with the co-production model that we have with NIPDP when it's up and running. So the overall benefit of a trusted research environment and what will be the benefit of the Northern Ireland trusted research environment, NIDER, is that it is a collaboration space. It is a space that makes um, a collaboration cost effective for the HSC and for researchers themselves, for our patients and for our public. So I hope that through the demonstration of some of the logos and the engagements and collaborations and partnerships that we've already undertaken and that you can see demonstrated through this presentation, um, we'll, we'll, we'll um, demonstrate that to you. If there's anybody on the call that wants to come and work with Niger or who wants to hear some more about some of the models and approaches we have here, I'll be more than happy to speak to you after the presentation. Um, at this point, given that NIDER is a collaborative workspace, I'd like to acknowledge all my colleagues in the HSC, our patients and our publics, and in particular, the staff of the Northern Ireland Honest Broker Service, HSC R&D, and the Administrative Data Research Centre Northern Ireland and Queen's and Ulster, who have been very supportive, along with Health Data Research UK, in supporting us in developing the Northern Ireland Trusted Research Environment, which now is a pillar of the Northern Ireland Data Institute. And that is NIDER. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, Francis. So we'll have a wee bit of opportunity now for if there's any questions. And I think actually there's one in the chat, if I'm right, from Eddie. Um, Eddie, are you still on the call? Do you maybe want to speak to your question yourself? I am on the call and I, and I can talk. Hi, Francis. Well done. <laughs> That's a great presentation. Thanks, um, so. Yeah, I think you've kind of answered the question a little bit as you've gone. I think you've, because you used you know, research and then you went on to talk a bit about audit and evaluation yeah. separately. So yeah. I, I think I think that my interpretation is that when you use the word research, you did mean to include 
audit and evaluation activities as well. Um, and I suppose where I was trying to get to was those safe standards that you outlined. I think the first one was safe people. Uh, and people had to undertake certain yeah. um, accreditation and training things. So yeah. my question is, if someone from the, in the HSC wanted to mm -hmm. do some audit and evaluation type activities, would they yeah. also have to go through the same uh, standards of accreditation? That's kind of where I was trying to get to. Yeah, it's a really good question. So the research audit evaluation cycle, most people on the call will, will be used to it. But as we've moved forward, obviously those lines become slightly blurred. So in a strict sense, the answer is no. If you're an external researcher, you need to have a researcher accreditation to access the data. If you were conducting a local audit based on your own data, then no, you would not need a separate permission to work on that data. Um, so within the secure data environment, you might have data from other sources held within the data institute and within the secure data environment which might require permissions for you to access it so there are different standards for access i think is what you're getting at so as a researcher there are different accreditations and standard for access than there would be for service evaluation or audit however one of the things that we need to do under the secure under the data institute and more widely within the hse is decide what standards of training and accreditation are actually needed to work with data now that we are providing these new innovative ways for people to access it and to manipulate it so it's a very valid question and it's one that we need to look at in a regional sense i was on a call on tuesday at a uk level where we were discussing the determination of what is the use of data for a secondary purpose when the use of research within direct care can affect the outcomes of direct care or the provision of direct care. And therefore, the use of data would be considered direct care, even though it's for research. So, for example, if you were somebody who was on a cancer care pathway, you might be using that person's data to change their care pathway because um, research is, is part of the delivery of care services under cancer. So therefore, you're using data for a direct purpose, even though research is involved within it. That's notwithstanding access within a secure data environment. So what we need to look at in terms of people's access and utility of data is what requirements are needed for somebody to be a competent person working with data in their normal day to day work. And what are the accreditations and training we expect whenever they enter a secure data environment, which is a different space again. Does that answer your question? I think so. Uh, so, so I think you said, um, I'm going to summarise it by my own words, from my own brain, uh, you have said the same standards do not necessarily apply to staff within the HSC, but it's something we need to work at. It is something we need to look at. There are standards for accessing data within a secure research environment, regardless of who that person is. And there are other standards of governance that are required if you're accessing data for a research purpose. OK, thank you. You're welcome. I guess, sorry, I just, so I guess when it comes to the whole um, building the confidence within the citizen domain about how we're looking after their data. Yeah. That's maybe one aspect that maybe probably needs to be progressed, doesn't it? Because yeah, people, absolutely. Need, like, it's reasonable for people to want to know um, absolutely. how their data is being used and who's looking at it. So the five safes are based on transparency. The five safes principle is based on transparency, whether that be, as I said, that, that term is interchangeable, a secure data environment or secure research environment. There are people who use data for audit purposes that is part of their job and part of their role. Primarily, whenever you're accessing data in a safe data environment for a research purpose, you are not somebody who is involved in the direct care of a person. You are strictly using that data for a secondary purpose, and that comes with caveats and training and requirement to allow you to access that data. OK, Francis, there's another question in the chat. Um, how complicated is bringing forward the legislation? Um, so bringing forward the legislation is not necessarily comp is not necessarily complicated. There are just steps to bringing forward regulation that have to be adhered to. That includes public consultation around the regulations itself and consultation with stakeholders who will be affected by the regulations, some of which I've demonstrated here um, in the presentation. Um, we were um, hampered by not having a sitting assembly or a minister for health or a health committee who are needed needed in order to progress the regulations, but now that we have that, it should be a less complicated process. We have the mechanisms in place to take it forward. 
Thank you. Um, another question. Um, if assistance is required from the system owners to extract specific data files, how will their efforts be resourced? It's a really good question. So it's one of the capabilities under the Data Institute and under the, the digital and data strategies more widely is to look at how we can support stakeholders across the system to bring data into central holdings and enable them to be used more widely. Um, one of the ways that we can do that under the trusted research environment is to um, attract external funding for research purposes under the auspice of using data in that way. Um, but in terms of um, more widely across the system, that will be part of the support mechanisms within the digital and data strategy. Thank you. Are, are there any other questions? Just Francis, if I can come in with one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you've mentioned that there's uh, topics that are already being suggested for the public data panel and yeah. just pure curiosity on my point part. Um, can you offer any sort of information as to what that includes at this point? Yeah, so um, there's a lot of conversation around what is public benefit and what is public good. There are some legal definitions around public benefit and public good, and we use those terms interchangeably. Um, and when we are conducting research, tip, people would typically give a public benefit or a patient benefit to research being undertaken. I think we need to get more specific. And one of the topics is to what do we actually mean by public good or public benefit and who gets to say what that is? And what are the balances and checks to understand what a public benefit is? So I know that we, uh, some people on this call will have been involved in ethical considerations for research and use of data. And ethically, something might be of benefit to a cohort of patients, but be a disbenefit or a neutral benefit to other people. The same applies, Lisa, whenever we're looking at what is a public benefit to use of data. So it's what does that mean for Northern Ireland and what is how do we articulate that to people in Northern Ireland? How do they understand that to be and how different or similar is that whenever you're looking at public benefit or patient benefit for health data and what that means for social care data or what does that mean for local government data? Um, so that's one of the things that's one of the questions that have come up. The other topics that have come up are around the public sensitivity to or support for using health and social care data outside of health and social care. So we've had some examples during COVID, for example, where local government wished to use some health and social care data. And for governance reasons, they weren't enabled to do so or it was complicated in the pathways to getting access and use of that data. So again, how does the public feel about their data being used in that way? One of the main things that's going to do, Lisa, is that I think we're, we have strong competencies within the HSE of talking to people when there are patients. We're already on a care pathway or we're recognising them as being advocates for certain, for certain areas. One of the things that the public panel does is talk to people not within the aspect of being a patient. We're speaking to people as members of the public in a general way. And the panel will be recruited randomly, so people will not be able to opt in because they have an active interest. They will be they will be invited to take part in the panel. So we'll have a random sample of people from across Northern Ireland taking part in that discourse. Great, thank you very much for that, Eddie. Did do you want to come in there again? Uh, I did. Thank you. <laughs> so one of the things you mentioned, in Francis, was around citizen opt out. Yes, I think you mentioned that people there may be a portal in place that citizens could go on to to um, yeah to opt out. So I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about what the plans are for that. Yeah, are you envisage so, that happening? Yeah. So one of the premise of the legislation is that we must put in place an opt out mechanism for people in Northern Ireland that they can opt out of secondary use of their data. Um. So how I envisage that happening or, or the discussions that we've had around that would be similar to the Northern Ireland portal for patients during COVID, where they were able to access their COVID certificates and, and, and that certification. Um, again, it'll be something that we will talk to BSO about. It'll be a central service for Northern Ireland, um, and it will have to be managed and audited to see who is opting out and what are the demographics of people opting in and opting out. Um, but it is a right that will be enshrined in the legislation and it is part of the regulatory requirement. So it's certainly a change in our landscape. We haven't had that before. Um, and it will mean that we need to, just as you said, we need to get better at how we speak to our public in terms of what we do and don't do with their data. The risk is if people are either ambivalent to or believe that we are not being trustworthy with their data, that they will just begin to opt out of things because they have a piece of legislation and a function that enables them to do that. Obviously, we don't want people to do that. 
the more that we can use population level data, the better the analysis that we can conduct. But that's only through people's perception of our use of their data and the services of the HSC more widely. OK, a um, couple more questions in the, the chat. So th there's issues with obtaining data sharing agreements between HSC organisations. And will this be streamlined for this category of data sharing requests? So again, one of the functions of the Data Institute is a central information governance support. And one of the things we will be working through are the complications and issues surrounding topics just like that. That's not unique to data sharing for research for more widely utility of research across the HSE as a regional asset. So yeah, we do have a resource in place for that where we didn't have before. And then the last question in the chat, um, have there been discussions around getting extracts from the data held on EPIC? Yes. We have some exemplar projects that we're hosting through the Northern Ireland Trusted Research Environment to do precisely that, which is to look at the archive. I'm looking at Joy, who's smiling at me here in the background. So we have some projects both to address how we extract and warehouse the data from EPIC so that we can link it to other data. So there, as you know, with the rollout of EPIC, there are some other data sets that will be replaced and will become what we would call a legacy data set. So one of the joint remits of the Data Institute, which the Northern Ireland Trusted Research Environment is supporting Joy and her colleagues in their work, is to archive that data from both EPIC and other data sets and maintain them in a data archive and allow access to them through a secure data environment. So yes is the answer in short. Thank you. Um, OK, just checking that I haven't missed any other questions. No, I think I think that's us, but I'm sure, Francis, you'll be very open to anyone reaching out to you now following course, yeah. this conversation. Of course. So um, thank you, everybody, um, for joining today. And as I said earlier, this will be available then as a recording on the DHCNI YouTube channel following this. So thank you, everyone.